have ahead of us. My name is Diego Blazquez. I'm the director of Democratic Memory. And today I will moderate and introduce the speakers that we have in this roundtable to uh, very well-known people. And unfortunately, our first speaker, uh, Adin Serp, couldn't make it uh, in person. Adin Serp couldn't make it here. But the fact is that we were able to organize uh, uh, well, uh, our session so that Rafael Escudero is here. I asked uh, the speakers to, to use uh, some 20 minutes so that we have the minimum possibility of having a, a further dialogue between them or, or you know, make a, um, or establish a, a dialogue. And we'll start with Professor Serp. She's a professor of uh, European Studies at the University of Maastricht. She's a doctor in history and compared policy, politics, uh, European politics. And she also worked on the Memorial of the, uh, the Hau Camp. She's the author of several books and articles on transnational history. And she's a responsible person of the Center of Studies of the Memory, uh, memory Center in, in Maastricht. I don't know translation, but I did introduce you, uh, your profile. And uh, at the same time, I established the rules for this uh, panel. I, I will ask you, as you know, because of my previous email, I give you around 20, 25 minutes, each, uh, each panelist, in order to make uh, able uh, to open a minimum debate or dialogue with the public and also with, uh, between, between with both of you. So uh, I open the floor. Thank you very much, Aline. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for this kind introduction. Um, thanks for all of you coming, despite the fact that this is a hybrid event, um, which is obviously not ideal. I would have wished to be with you in person at, in Barcelona uh, and said I'm sitting in Maastricht. Um, but I hope that we can still have some uh, fruitful debate here. Um, I will share my screen so that you can follow a little bit on um, the, the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so I was asked to provide you with the European frame um, of the topic that we're discussing in this panel, the evolution of memory policies um, with special attention, of course, to the laws and legislative initiatives of the European Union. Um, I'd like to start by saying that the European Union is, of course, not a state. It has no legal competence when it comes to memory, and it certainly cannot pass memory laws. So there we have a fundamental difference compared to the Spanish case. Um, so I, I, again, to start, so what I was asked to do was to provide you with the European frame, um, the evolution of memory policies um, with special attention to the laws and legislative initiatives of the European Union. Um, and I have to start really with a premise, which is that the European Union is not a state. Um, it has no legal competences when it comes to memory, um, and it certainly cannot pass memory laws. Um, so in that sense, we have a very different situation compared to the Spanish state, um, which we will discuss um, in the second uh, presentation. I think the only element that comes closest to some sort of memory law um, is the Council Framework decision of 2008. Um, with an obligation to criminalize all kinds of genocide denialism across the European Union. Um, however, if you look, and I, I really try to, to see what um, the EU is doing in that context, um, if you look at the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union, then you can see that there's not one single judgment um, where the Council framework decision um, was cited as a principal instrument of secondary law. Um, Um, so let's see if uh, if Euron is doing that. Uh, maybe it works. <laughs> doing my my presentation. I will continue working. I think. Um, I, I will I will continue to 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 talk. Um, so basically, there's no um, there's no explicit references to memory loss um, per se either. Um, and when I talked to a colleague um, who is a lawyer and he's been dealing with this topic for years, she indeed said that in all interviews that she's been conducting, um, EU officials usually say that they are not some sort of memory police and they also don't want to be some sort of memory police. Having said that, it doesn't mean that the European Union um, is teethless. 
Um, opinions, of course, are expressed by the European Court of Human Rights. Um, that's a Council of Europe uh, institution. Um, and, of course, you have the so-called soft law, if you so want, in the shape of resolutions um, of the European Parliament. Uh, and this is exactly what I'm going to concentrate on in the next 20 minutes or so, to give you a bit of an overview um, of the historical development of memory policies in the European Union um, and the initiatives um, that, uh, that are uh, stemming from this uh, to determine the European context of the Spanish law. So memories, especially of World War II, have played an important role in the establishment of many international organizations. Um, the whole issue of memory and identity was really running like a red thread through most thinking of supranational organizations. Just think about uh, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, the Council of Europe, I, I cited earlier, um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, and then, of course, the European Coal and Steel Community, which was the predecessor of the, uh, what we now call the European Union. Um, memory and the reference to World War II um, played a really important role um, for the founding years of the European Union and became some sort of EU founding myth. Um, it was especially this idea of a peace project in response to the experiences of war and dictatorship um, and the memories of the first decade of the 20th century um, that made the memories of the first decade of the 20th century ever present in the early years of European integration. Um, the determination to avoid another war has since the Schumann Declaration on the 9th of May 1950 been central to the master narrative. It's repeatedly being evoked in official documents and political speeches and uh, to a certain extent influenced the setup of the U Union's institutions. Considering this, it's actually quite surprising that EU activism remained exclusively on the level of symbolic politics. We have to keep in mind that, of course, that European competencies have been and still are very limited in that area. Um, no active attempt was made to devise concrete EU, EU policies until fairly recently. Now, this changed in the 1970s. Um, in the 1970s, probably remember the oil crisis and the ensuring loss of confidence in the European integration project. It's called often a period of eurosclerosis. And this was the moment when policymakers understood um, that, and I quote directly from Delors, one could not fall in love with a common market. This was the moment really when culture and cultural policies acquired a new meaning as some sort of glue that could hold Europeans together in times of crisis. If you look at the efforts um, that were made by European institutions in this context, they initially concentrated on activities that were promoting a common European heritage. Um, the most obvious example of this is the uh, European Capitals of Culture program that uh, you're probably familiar with, um, a program born in 1985 that incarnated the idea of a common European memory and identity going beyond abstract political principles. The early years of this program, um, the focus was really put on, on positive heritage. Um, then in the 1970s, uh, the history of European integration itself became the focus of commemoration, um, and some sort of teleological narrative was created um, that in many ways is still present in, uh, in today's European Union, but did not prove to be very successful with European citizens. Now, the willingness to include also negative elements, so for example, references to concentration camps um, in the list of heritage sites um, that warranted protection, developed rather slowly. Um, it really took until the 1990s before this changed. Uh, and if you compare it to developments on the national level, then you can see that this is a parallel development. It's not very different on the national level. Now, the end of the Cold War exacerbated those developments further. Uh, especially the breaking open of the bipolar world led to an eruptive return of memory and the reawakening of history. The crumbling of national myths made uh, a new confrontation with questions of guilt and responsibility necessary for both East and West. And that included also a new element, um, which was the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust had played no role for early European integration and was certainly not considered to be a point of reference. Um, the silence is obviously, again, similar to what happened on the national level. 
the interpretation of the Holocaust um, as a founding act is thus only plausible from an ex post perspective. And it has to be understood within a certain context, namely an attempt to create an overarching political identity beyond the institutional framework of the European Union by adding a transnational layer to national identities and memories. The EU debate in this context um, is part of a much later, larger debate that takes place transatlantically and um, goes beyond the very narrow boundaries of the European Union. The result of this was a flurry of activities starting in the 1990s on the institutional level with the aim to anchor its memory firmly to the institutional setting. The European Parliament especially passed several resolutions that were addressing World War II and the murder of the European Jews. And the EP resolution in 1995 declared the 27th of January as European White Day to commemorate the Holocaust. If you look in the Eurolex repository, um, and you search for your Holocaust, and you can see that it has occupied more space in EU documents since 1990s than most other events in European history. The Holocaust has become the yardstick with which many other political developments are being measured and evaluated. And the nation's ability to face up to its national past in some way or another has become a soft entrance criterion for joining the EU. Um, which is one of the reasons why it has become one of the linchpins of the more recent debates on memory politics on the European level, because it had profound implications for the accession of the Central and Eastern European states in 2004. This was not really the case, yes, when Spain uh, joined. Um, I, I looked into this, um, how much the Spanish transition, for example, played a role um, when it came to the accession of, of Spain. Um, and this is, uh, there's not very much there. So this is interesting that this is, again, a fairly new development. Now, from the very first sitting of the European Parliament, um, many of the newly admitted EU member states challenged this very Western European representation of World War II um, and the Holocaust. For them, of course, the end of World War II had meant the beginning of a new period of repression by the Soviet Union, which meant that the new experience of communist dictatorship had superseded the memory of what had happened before. The requirement then to... Um, to, uh, to accept the EU endorsed narrative as part of the accession process was perceived as an imposition. MEPs from the new member states questioned the Western interpretation of history and used the European Parliament as a platform to put forward an alternative memory narrative according to which the experience of suffering under Nazism and Stalinism are comparable and should as such receive equal recognition. This came in the minds of a lot of Western MEPs um, close to, this, to a falsification of history um, and was met with very fierce resistance. And interestingly enough, most rulings of the European Court of Human Rights are indeed on this topic. So, for example, the denial of communist crimes, the struggle of remembrance, etc. If we look at the more recent incidents of memory clash, it also becomes clear that memory and remembrance continue to be used as political tools to underline differences or legitimize political action or inaction, as in the case of Ukraine. The impression of a tension and conflict-free European memory policies, as might be suggested by the resolutions of the European Parliament, is thus certainly quite deceptive. This does not mean, however, that the EU memory politics is ineffective uh, because of the inherent impossibility to create a conflict-free policy. Indeed, if you look a bit closer at the initiatives of the European Commission, um, it is revealed that debate and conflict are welcomed. And why is that? Because they're probably seen as elements that can contribute to the formation of a European public sphere. Now, the most emblematic memory initiative by the European Commission is the Europe for Citizens program. It's not called European for Citizens program anymore, um, but the initial program um, you're probably uh, most familiar with. And this was launched in December 2006. Um, it was based on the belief that an open memory culture thrives only with citizens' engagement. Um, and the aim was really to mobilize grassroots action by research institutes, museums, human rights organizations, and civil society associations. And it was through the promotion of citizens' initiatives and this targeting a level that lies below the official state level, which is, I think, a very interesting point, um, a civil understanding of history is being aimed at that allows for an active exchange between different memory cultures. 
In contrast to those very ambitious ideas of the program stands the amount of funding that is actually available. Um, considering the importance that has been attached by European policymakers to memory identity issues in the past years, the discrepancy between aims and financial means remains striking. Now, to conclude, I think I've almost reached my, my uh, limited speaker time, um, and since I lost some time, I <laughs> better conclude quickly, is that, um, yeah, to conclude, I'd like to say that, um, um, in, in a way, recent EU policies seem to closely adhere to the considerations of scholars who have postulated the idea that there is no such thing as collective memory, but that there can very well be collective conditions for memories. The attempt of the Commission to support initiatives that aim at creating a democratic culture of discussion needs to be understood in this context. There's also deeper lying reasons, however. Memory conflicts are seen as damaging for the integration project. The importance of remembering the past is clearly linked in both European Parliament resolutions and European Commission initiatives um, to what is perceived as threats to the current state of democracy and the basic values lying at the heart of European integration. The way in which the EU tries to connect past, present and future says a lot about the self-image it wants to convey and the vision it wishes to foster among its citizens. Equally telling though is what is being overlooked. And that's, for example, the memory of colonialism and imperialism. The EU has remained curiously quiet about both, despite the fact that the history of colonialism is intrinsically linked to the history of European integration. It seems as if by concentrating its remembrance efforts for decades almost exclusively on the experience of Nazism, fascism, natural socialism and Stalinism, it has excluded the memory of Europeans as perpetrators of colonial crimes from a shared past. It's also curious, and that's how I link, I think, a little bit to the, to the debate uh, we will have uh, later, curious is also that fascism in southern European states does not play much of a role. During the debate on the 2009 resolution establishing a European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Stalinism and Nazism, those other totalitarianisms were included. Um, it also played a role in the, in the accession debates, um, but there were no specific recent debates or rulings, also not on the, on the memory laws um, that, that were passed. I really carefully checked everywhere. There was some um, media debate, and of course, um, uh, EU media outlets reported about this, but um, otherwise, uh, you, you, I couldn't find anything. So there's no debate, for example, in the European Parliament. I should say yet, because this can still come. Huh? We, are, we are very early in the process here. I think it remains to be seen how the EU will deal with those evident gaps in remembrance landscape in this future um, and how it will also deal with uh, memory laws that are being passed by the different member states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aline, for your effort. Anyway, you have to really fulfill the... Uh Oh, hello, sorry. Uh, I was saying, Aline, thank you very much. You really fulfill with the um, time as, uh, we have agreed, I including uh, the problem with your presentation. We are very, for, uh, we are very sorry uh, for the disturbances, and I'm sure next time we will have you together. Uh, bueno, yo creo que ha sido muy I think it's been very uh, interesting to uh, see. Well, I have a screen that I don't quite understand. Well, there it goes. As I said, it was very interesting to see the uh, present general presentation made by uh, Dr. Alin Sirp on the European framework, and the, uh, challenges, conditions, limits, etc. The issue of uh, collective memory that we do share collectively, particularly in all European countries, about uh, colonialism, imperialism, and the decolonization is something that yesterday uh, was evidenced by the two representatives of the Commission, both Ana Gallego as well as uh, Gilles uh, Pelayo. And probably this is an issue that in some other time we should approach. Uh, as Alain Sirp, uh, well, each member state has its own characteristics and circumstances. And in our case, uh, things uh, are very specific. In all the talk uh, in this European framework that for us is very important about the new law of democratic memory from October 19th, well, we have uh, Rafael Scudero is currently 
the Secretary General of Consumption. It's very difficult for me to uh, present his uh, public, uh, his bio published in the transparency portal because I uh, am connected to, uh, through um, other uh, scholarly links. I learned, uh, I learned a lot from from him when he began teaching. I was starting uh, my 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 PhD studies, and it's a person that. Uh, that uh, I will have a hard time introducing. I will try to introduce the four points as uh, I introduced with his professor at Carlos III University of Madrid, International Public Law and Philosophy, and uh, so his doctor in uh, law. And uh, currently, he is uh, the Secretary, Just Secretary General of Consumption at the Ministry of Consumption. He has been the Director of Human Rights Office in the City Council of Madrid, where uh, we also coincided working for some time, and he's the author of a large amount of books and articles in covering uh, legal theory, studies on democracy and human rights. He's an expert uh, in critic memory. I cannot uh, underscore any of his uh, works because each one of his uh, works uh, has been uh, the reference for other people, so to us it's a real pleasure to listen to, to him and his opinion about uh, our law and the mandate that the General Directorate has. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the EU Rome and the University of Barcelona and the Secretariat of State for Historical Memory, their invitation to participate in the event. As you may have noticed, Professor Blasquez and I are colleagues at the Department of University. We've also been together in Madrid's uh, city council. We had the same teacher, Professor Peces Barba. So yeah, I mean, it's an academic lifetime together. And uh, yeah, I, I find it noteworthy. I would like to congratulate the organization on the reputed speakers they've had on the event. I feel very proud of being on the same list of all those illustrious speakers I so much learned from. And also, I congratulate them on the opportunity. At a time in Spain where we've just ha passed a new law, this is completely new, and I think events like this help us think, help us reflect on the policies that we need to develop now once that the law has been passed. My presentation is titled Towards New Legislation in Spain. And the first word in the title is towards, so there is a time reference, which makes sense given the subject. But if I want to stick to the title, I must start by going back to the origin of where we're at now with the approval of Act 20 stroke 22, new Spanish legislation. Let me tell you that any uh, historical sele or selection or hi of historical information has a discretionary element. So these are the elements which, for me, have been most striking to take us to where we are at with a new law, which takes us to a completely new field for the implementation of new memory policies to guarantee the victims' rights. So let me mention four elements. I'll try and be brief so that we can then focus on the law and stick to the 20-ish minutes that I have. So first point from our past, law 52 stroke 2007, which recognizes rights and measures for those who were object of persecution uh, during Franco's times. It used to be known historical memory law, although that wasn't its proper name. It was highly criticized, both by the memorialist movement and the academia. 
researchers and academicians, basically because of the scope of its implementation, because it had limits. It didn't accept international background limitations on how to approach this uh, violent pasts, for example, the framework of transactional justice. It didn't even define victims of Francoism, and it didn't respond to the philosophy which underlies the concept of historical memory. If you look, if you Google, if you search for historical memory in that law, it it wasn't mentioned. There was only one reference to a particular fund. It didn't cancel the court rulings from Franco's times, which was something that had long been claimed for, and it externalized or privatized the exhumation of the disappeared people through a kind of weird subsidy system, which has, was highly criticized. So this presumed failure of the law was spotted well in advance when the law was passed, and it was corroborated with the poor regulatory uh, distribution it had, and it was clearly seen with the approval of the new law, which in fact derogates the old 52 stroke 2007 law. Second point in my towards the judicial moment, state courts and international courts, legal courts, in generally, the attempts of uh, victims to have their rights uh, exercised has been negative, except in some honorable exceptions. For example, we can quote the Garzón case, which closed the door on any uh, other um, court cases in Spain for the same reason, but also any other attempt at getting remedy before the law that was all uh, put an end to by the Constitutional Court. Let me remind you of the attempt to revise at the Criminal Court of the Supreme Court of the communist poet Miguel Hernández's case before the European law uh, court of human rights, things haven't uh, gone much further either. So apart from those few positive results in terms of guarantee of rights, if there's anything positive we can say about this legal uh, journey has been the internationalization of the Spanish case. Internationalization, which is twofold. First, because there is an advancement of the thesis of the application of the international law in the Spanish case. And second, there is also an advancement in the normalization of the Spanish case to, with uh, other cases seen in Europe in the 20th century, thus avoiding the persistence of a kind of Spanish exception, which uh, kind of justified the non-implementation of international categories in what was often mentioned as the Spanish War. Third point, the new regional law from 2015. Some regions in Spain had already, before 2015, initiated legal procedures to have their own regional legal framework. It was after the elections of 2015 where there is a clear political push to regulate the matter. Today, please correct me if I am mistaken, there are 12 regions in Spain with their own memory laws, plus two which I believe still have some uh, lower uh, level regulation. So there are only three regions which have no regulation on the matter. I think that this new generation regional laws, which are to be added to the old ones from 2015, shared some traits, although they are obviously different. And this affects their uh, implementation. They share the idea of human rights for victims. They talk about historical memory, even democratic memory. And in fact, they develop the, the duties of the regional authorities to have rights uh, protected. 
And finally, our final point is the exhumation of the dictator from what is now rightly called Valle de Cuelgamuros, the former Valley of the Fallen. The exhumation of Franco's remains uh, was the result of the joint efforts of the three powers of state, which is something completely new. There was first the political will from the government. They pushed the process along, and they pushed the reform of the historical uh, reform of the law, adding a new clause to section 16 that said in that in the Valley of the Fallen, there could only be the remains of the people who died during the civil war, nobody else. Then this was accepted by the legislative, and finally the Supreme Court rejected the uh, appeal by Franco's families who wanted to avoid the exhumation. So it is the first time that all three powers of the state support a measure which means a huge step forwards. And uh, with this, I would kind of finish this brief historical uh, contextualization, saying that the new law in 2022 comes from all of that. It accepts that the law in 2007 was not enough. Then it accepts that victims' rights have to be protected, and it accepts that there is now political will at regional and state level. And there is always the presence, the active and critical presence of the memorialistic movement, associations of uh, human rights defenders, and academia. Now, I'd like to mention the general guidelines of the law. I'll mention the main aspects and the main measures which emanate from these lines. First, there is the resource to international law. This is present throughout the law. So they accept the thesis of the applicability of this framework to the victims of serious crimes against humanity during the coup d'etat and then Francoist times. So there are three main elements here. The crimes of Franco's times are crimes against humanity. Two, the victims can receive all the regulations that protect their rights. And three, that the Spanish state has obligations not just towards the victims, and their citizens, but also towards the international community. This internationalization kind of overcomes, if you remember, the approval process for the law in 2007. During the debate, one of the criticisms was the Argentinization of the Spanish process because of the figure of the disappeared people. So this internationalization, what I would call the normalization, overcomes those complaints. And this is expressed in two elements. One, the legal configuration of the category victims of Francoism, which didn't exist before in our legislation, and two, the legal treatment of the disappeared people because of Franco's repressions. Let me go back to number one. The law defines Franco's victims, translated into the Spanish case, the definition of victims of serious violations of human rights adopted in 2005 by the Association, by the General Assembly of UN. So all international law recommendations are accepted. So the victims are not only the people whose rights are violated, but also their direct relatives and people uh, close to them, just as international regulations do. Article 3, which defines victims of Francoism, first has this general definition, and then it has a series of collectives. And I think it is not numerous clauses. So it's not exhaustive, which uh, people who suffer uh, victimization, they might be private individuals, uh, associations, or non-tangible bodies. 
This list of uh, uh, groups covers another international requirement, which is the visibilization of victims, their names and the motives, the reasons why they were victimized. And from this obligation, thereby emanates the uh, drafting of a state census. I think a lot has been said on this already, so I won't go into that. Just two points. A census which needs to be de-aggregated with specific identification of the different groups of victims, for example, women or LGBTI community, in order to make them visible and also specifying the reasons and circumstances of the victimization. So all the doctrinal recommendations are complied with for this part of the law. And the legislator also covers forced disappearances, and therefore they cover the Argentinization of the Spanish process. And this means that the reparation measures that had been approved during the transition, which had been considered not to be enough, but at any rate they were a start, they were limited to people who died as a result, and I quote, as a result or upon the occasion of the civil war. And that meant that it was just sort of dead combatants. And it left aside, so without having preparation, extrajudicial uh, killings or the people who had not been found. In 2007, an attempt had been made to repair this unsuccessfully, but with the new law, there is this new category, and it is established, and I believe that this is another star measure in the law, that it is an obligation for the state to find, trace, uh, exhumate, identify all disappeared people. This is one of the big steps forwards in the law. We all have to be aware of it, and we have to be aware of the fact that this is one of the big demands of victims' associations who always thought it was essential to have this state's obligation specified. So here it is. Second theoretical paradigm, which is present in the new legislation, about historical memory, democratic memory, and the rights this entails. Something that Walter Benjamin taught us is that the past demands rights. In this case, those of right, truth, and reparation. But before we go on to these rights, let's talk about the implications of the fact that the regulator talks about democratic memory. So let me talk first about the noun, memory, and then the adjective, democratic, on memory. The legislative power talks about uh, memory. I mean, forgetting is not an option in our democracy. The belief that the recovery of memory, those uh, lower case history or histories, it is, is essential for society to avoid repetition and to make sure that we have a collective identity based on human rights and on citizenry values. We will only have this collective identity if we comply with our duty to memory to all those victims who were tortured, killed, or made prisoners. As Reyes Mate says, without memory there is no justice because facts disappear, victims disappear, and responsibilities disappear. And this is why the legislator opts for the adjective democratic rather than historic memory. I think that the recovery of the memory, so active policies to guarantee the rights that memory entails, have to focus on the memory of those who were victimized because they were defending the republic uh, or their rights, not just to repair the historical neglect towards the victims of the so-called other side, or because that is what international law says, but also because it is those victims, those who were victimized because they stood up for democracy, their struggle and their memory, which need to be extolled in a democratic society if they are to be understood as reference. So the memory is a moral duty and an instrument to create collective identity. And that's why the law tells us powers, public powers, that we have to implement a series of policies that go beyond guaranteeing individual people's rights. And with it, they, they talk about collective rights. 
the collective right to memory, a right which is held by all citizens. Apologies for speaking so fast. I'll just quote some points. For example, the policies on symbologies in public spaces. These policies are easily understood if we analyze them not so much as tools for reparation for the victims, although that's also true, but also if we analyze them from the point of view of education and culture. The public space needs to be, in principle, devoid of symbolic references, for example, statues or names of street that may extort people or events which are against human rights. The public space is a mirror in which citizens could reflect themselves, and therefore, the points of reference have to be fitting with democratic cultures and the culture of human rights. So the law insists on regulating the spaces of a public democratic memory. These public spaces are conceived as having a reparative function and a didactic function. One of the challenges for the future is that public administrations have to make sure that those public spaces remain there for our young, for future generations. I believe the law also covers the issue of removing Franco symbols from public spaces, making sure that we don't see any more uh, cases like we saw in Madrid, where some judges demanded that old names had to be reused, or also the use of artistic religious reasons, uh, which appeared in 2007. Yeah. Public administrations are told that all those symbols have to be removed, and uh, also um, uh, titles and uh, nobility uh, titles which were granted during Franco's times have, are removed. All those symbols, the removal of those symbols, I believe is also compatible, although it is controversial, with the maintenance and resignification of relevant spaces or spaces which are useful for the creation of recreation of our past. The legislature talks about the educational use of those spaces, for example, in Europe, concentration camps, as a tool to convey democratic values. This is clear in case of the legal treatment of the Valley of Cuelgamuros, the former Valley of the Fallen. I think that something similar happens in the case of Fuerte de San Cristobal or the Palace of the Summit in the Basque Country. But there is another challenge for our future here, which is the complex intervention which is going to be required in the Valley of Cuelgamuros, sorting out the signification and sorting out the issue of those human remains which are still there without even their relatives being aware of it. So I think that Cuelgamuros remains a challenge. So general principle. The end of the equidistance between republic and dictatorship, which had ruled over memory laws after the transition for the people who were, uh, uh, who protected the transition said that the, the pact had to be to forget the past so that the past could not be used by either side. This hypothetical pact had worked against the claims of the victims, and it had made us close our eyes to our democratic successes. I think the new regulation breaks away from this equidistance. It anchors its roots in the democratic threat that was started in 2012, recognizing the Republican successes and the authoritarian regime of Franco. The, all this historical thread translates in judicial terms in some of the elements of the law. What could not be done in 2007 
because there were judicial uh, safety matters can now be done, which is the declaration of uh, nullity of the rulings that came from uh, Franco's times. The nullity is the legal formula used to get rid of the legal effects of a court ruling. I think that this is better than the hybrid formula used in 2007. And this is more in line with what international law says. My fourth general principle of the law, I mean, this is my selection, obviously, you could make your own, is the treatment of the right to justice for the victims. This is highly controversial. United Nations defines this right as their right to initiate uh, court cases because all these uh, investigations need to be need to be made public. The thing is that time and law are never good partners. I mean, we've seen that clearly this week in Spain on other matters. But when the law starts ruling things that came from the past, yeah, this is never comfortable. This is never easy. There is a derogation, nullity. I mean, we're talking about splitting hairs. The law establishes two measures to satisfy this right. First, the creation of a court attorney for cases which are about the violation of human rights. And second, it goes back to the uh, file for regulation for perpetual memory, which disappeared in 2015, I believe, as a way to obtain uh, declarations on the events that happened. And this makes it possible to proceed to exhumations. And then the third point appears at the end of the law, Article 2.3, which introduces the uh, principle of generality of the understanding of the law. It says that all laws have to be interpreted according to international law, according to which crimes of war, genocide, crimes against humanity, and torture are, do not prescribe and are not liable to amnesty. So Article 2.3 specify what it's already said on Article 10 that says that all laws on human rights have to be interpreted according to international law. But the political message is important. It's important what is being said to the people who have to implement the law, which is the judges. So they're saying, when it comes to looking into facts to do with human rights violations, you have to take into account that these facts do not prescribe and are not liable to amnesties. I don't think anything else can be done by the regulators. I mean, that's the most they can do. From that on, it is up to the judges to apply this and to apply the law. Legislators cannot go beyond that. that they just have, all they can do is to give this clear message. Even if the law had derogated the famous law of amnesty, and this wouldn't have put an end to the problem because judges have to also bear in mind other elements at hand. For example, the death of the uh, presumed uh, killers or victims. So the derogation of the law of amnesty would not have solved the matter. And that was also a claim from academia and many associations. That wouldn't have solved anything because this needs to be taken to judges. Let me finish, and apologies for taking so long, with two challenges. I believe that tackling this matter of compensating or offsetting the fact that they cannot go beyond uh, with other measures, well, we need to think about that in the future in order to move forwards in other fields. 
And also, we have to bear in mind that this law and the implementation of this law is going to have economic costs and budgetary costs for all administrations. And this is going to be complicated at a time of post-pandemic reconstruction of our country. And finally, our third challenge is the implementation that the implementation of the law requires considerable political will by the corresponding uh, uh, political bodies, which are all of them. Without that political will, the law could just uh, die out. So we need authorities who believe in this law and who are willing to implement it. Apologies for having taken so long and spoken so fast. Well, thank you very much. I think it's been really worth it to, to have this extra uh, 10 minutes. No one will really care about it. But I would like to open up for debate. I don't know if we have uh, time or, or not. Maybe use this opportunity to, to debate about some of the uh, topics that have been presented. Alin, can you hear me? Alin? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. If you got also any questions, please uh, feel free to ask or, or to interact with, uh, with our public. I will, I will let you know because I, the problem is that I think that you cannot hear them, okay? So I will translate for, or not, not translate, but I will translate you uh, <laughs> via the microphone. I had a question uh, before we heard the colonial issue that it's necessary to have a legislative uh, evolution on this matter, but the, the, the law of democratic memory was not derived right because we might fall on the trap of believing that the lonely colonialism that deserves uh, a revision is Franco's colonialism. I don't think this is the issue, but I would really like to ask if in the new law of democratic law there is a margin of recognition uh, with respect to the colonial Frankism, the will of identifying these groups, because colonialism affected all people that lived there, but there were groups that were negatively affected. Um, they were victims of reprisal in Guinea in 1959, or the consequences of the civil uh, war in the city of Bata, or such type of, of things. Uh, I don't know if there's a possibility of uh, recognizing these this, this groups of people to, to compensate them in one way or another. We understand that there is uh, well, uh, uh, well, the, 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 brig the brigade participants, the international brigade participants, the brigadists, uh, well, we recognize it. Is it a, a difficult issue or is there a real margin law that uh, can allow this type of recognition? Thank you. Briefly, I am not. Uh, I'm not intervening here. I'm simply uh, introducing uh, speakers and, and, and listening to what is being said. The law is uh, flexible enough as to approach uh, different questions. In fact, in the uh, law text. And, 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 and in the parliament, in the public participation, uh, some questions uh, have been included connected to the social development. I would point out to the issue of polio and, and, and uh, gypsy land, gypsies that approach this issue. I think that one of the reasons uh, for the change of, of adjective of a democratic memory is to be able to make uh, an analysis from a critical standpoint of our global past. I believe that for the development of all these questions, it's not only a matter of uh, decision where we need a legal basis, but I also coincide with Rafael that we need a political will. I believe that this law would allow this flexibility to progress in that path, and we uh, can see around uh, us, uh, France and uh, UK, etc., the Netherlands are approaching the issue of colonialism and decolonization 
in different spheres of action culturally, basically in, in culturally, but also repression. Another very important element that I would place uh, in amongst the challenges that Rafael Jodero talked about is the maintenance of a the maintenance of the of, of a pulse uh, of civil society and the uh, academia. I believe this law will also require a, will need a lot to, to continue with that tension, to continue with the tension and progress towards uh, new spaces. Can I ask something? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting for me to, to listen to uh, Pro Professor Escudero. Um, from what I understood is that this, this law has gone through quite a genesis, right? Um, building on previous legislation. Um, and uh, I was struck by some of the um, attributes that, that you used, um, democratic identity, etc. Like there, there's, there's lots of thinking behind it when it comes to um, uh, Spanish society, I think. And I was wondering to what extent um, was there also um, inspiration from other countries? So if we talk about the European frame, um, to what extent was uh, were memory loss in other countries looked at um, in, in positive and negative terms? Um, was there any kind of exchange between different actors, for example, um, uh, or processes in other countries that um, had taken place before um, the Spanish uh, law passed? Yes, in, in fact, Inspiration from other countries, making a, 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 a comparative law analysis. The problem here is, let me go back to, to what I said before, the problem is time. Because uh, in our surrounding countries, uh, to, to, uh, uh, academically, we had worked on this concept. Uh, con countries that had uh, uh, countries that had uh, implemented the nullity of the sentences, well, like France or Germany, took them a little longer. But these were process of transitional justice. They happened on, right on the spot. This helps. Uh, but in our case, for example, an expert politologist uh, pretends to say that our case in Spain is a post-transitional case when speaking about nullity. Well, a long time has uh, gone by, and this makes things more complex. That's why the comparison between uh, or with the countries of our sphere of action is not so valid, because circumstances are very different. I think this is the uh, differential element. And also, because uh, these are questions that in other societies had been, quote unquote, already solved when uh, going from dictatorship to, to democracy in France or Italy after the Nazi occupation. It was more clear in Spain. In Spain, we have not solved this yet. The Spanish exception is still present in many spheres of action by listening to, to to, we're listening to the director of the Museum of the Holocaust in Tel Aviv. No, did not Tel Aviv in uh, in well, the director of this mu museum observed questions that, uh, for his society in his uh, context, seem to be very simple and very clear. Our society is still very divided in that respect. There was another yes. question. I have a question for Professor Aline Sierp. I hope uh, she can hear me. Uh, can we consider European Union narratives on memory uh, as an attempt to build a framework to harmonize different national memory politics, or instead uh, European Union symbolic narratives and debates on memory show us that European memory 
European memories are still profoundly divided both on national and political lines. Thank you very much. I mean, you got off um, the floor. Sorry? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the answer is very clear. I mean, um, definitely there's uh, lots of divisions still present in Europe. Um, and I think I hinted, hinted to that. Um, these divisions are often used uh, politically as well uh, to push forward uh, specific claims. Um, and I think there's also no way of, of getting to some sort of European memory, um, a harmonized kind of narrative. It, 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 this will never happen, I think. Um, however, if you look at the initiatives by the European Union, um, I have the impression that the aim is not really to create some sort of top-down, harmonized, um, uh, smallest common denominator uh, narrative um, that policymakers have understood fairly early on that um, that is a lost uh, case, that that will not be very successful. Um, and instead, uh, they're aiming at uh, exchange. Um, so if you look especially at the, the initiatives that are being supported, um, they really try to get people to talk to each other on, on the society level. Um, so uh, less initiatives that are aiming at the national level, um, I think that's, that's not being tried to be influenced, um, but it's really rather on the society level, um, for example, fostering initiatives that are getting people to talk to each other, exchanging their different narratives, exchanging their memories um, to create some sort of, yeah, understanding for the differences that there are in, in Europe. Um, and you can see that almost uh, everywhere. I mean, we, we have those different experiences um, and uh, it, it just, it would be impossible to create some sort of unifying narrative. People would not identify with that. Uh, yes. May I add something, Aline? I would like to add something because I think this is all very important, what now we call the European memory narrative. Well, it's clear what the origin of the European Union is. There is a common narrative. There, it's a memory against destruction, against the war. This is uh, clear as time goes by. Things uh, sometimes change a little bit, but the tension or the temptation of going back to national narratives, to uh, strong values is forgotten. But I believe that it would be more convenient on the European standpoint, it would be more convenient to go back to, to concepts that are closer to the uh, German term of constitutional patriotism then go but to the idea of narratives because now we have the temptation to look for the identities in strong values or ethnic values and their or ethnics or religious or, or identities uh, having to do with language etc there is where things are lost and going back to the essence of of values, I think it's very interesting. That's why the Commission has a very good uh, idea while connecting these questions with the policy of European values, strengthening this, the, the state of law and the Initiative for Democracy. I'm sorry for uh, participating in the debate. I don't think there are any further questions. Uh, Hello. This morning we were speaking during uh, our Argentinian colleagues' intervention about <laughs> the laws of uh, final full stop abuses and state terrorism. And with respect to this, the full stop laws indicate the, what happened in the transition in Spain. I came here to learn. I'm not going to to argue with the two uh, teachers of, of law. But it would have been a, a real disaster to see the derogation of the law of amnesty taken as a whole. But I believe that laws have an area of implementation that can maybe temporary, maybe local, maybe sectorial, etc. Maybe this is the question. Maybe it would uh, it would have been a good thing 
to derogate, to completely derogate. Some, at least. <laughs> Maybe this would have meant to go back to prison, but that's the question. Maybe uh, it was possible to uh, all those that fought for democracy uh, should be separated from the, the those that, that tortured others. We have clear cases. Such people like Billy the Kid, it was a policeman that was condecorated. This happens in other places of Europe. Thank you. Well, the uh, arguing, maybe not discussing, definitely. Uh, uh, law and amnesty is a topic that uh, generates a great deal of food for thought. The problem in terms of human rights uh, on the law and amnesty is Articles 2A and F, where we incorporate uh, at the end of the parliamentary uh, management uh, of, on the law of amnesty, we have all those uh, facts uh, perpetrated by the uh, law enforcement agency. The rest is not part of it. But uh, what I wanted to, was to, to avoid the debate uh, in pragmatic terms. In pragmatic terms, even if uh, these two articles had been derogated, and what legislators says according to the Constitution, that, well, they have to be interpreted according to the international uh, regulations. But if even if they had been derogated under uh, uh, standpoint of judiciary processes, little would have changed because judges can implement other elements at stake when uh, rejecting to to investigate good good arguments. I'm, I'm not I'm not minimizing them. They can be used. Therefore, what I uh, I'm speaking about now to be more pragmatic is to avoid a, a debate. Let's debate as much as we want. But let's avoid a, a debate that is a false debate. Let's avoid uh, this because judges may end up saying that not only uh, there's an amnesty or there's no amnesty, they may say that these facts cannot be sub submitted to, under, to the investigation because the victims um, passed away. That was my only. Uh, intention when I talked about the law of, on amnesty. It's a false debate in pragmatic terms. For the rest, well, there's a long debate behind it all about amnesty. And when they, we have the legal formula, derogation or, or, or nullity in the Argentinian style. But currently, uh, the moment we are living in, it's very important in the political course to get in order to guarantee the rights. This debate can. Uh, this can distort the image with respect to other challenges that are key and that will be discussed next year. That was my point. I, my point was a very pragmatic one. Thank you. I don't think there are any questions. Uh, we don't have much time because Professor Escudero has to take a train. So uh, I would like to thank you all for focusing so much of your time and the patience that you've had during today's session. Uh, and I would like to thank Professor Scudero and uh, our uh, speaker from Maastricht, uh, Aline Sir. Uh, the uh, possibility to share with you our own problems and to also set the Spanish uh, own experience on memorial policies in this European context. Muchas gracias a todos. Mañana. Thank you, everyone. And tomorrow we'll go back to the sessions. We'll be back with a very intense day with two round tables and the closing of the uh, event. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.